everyone. Thank you for joining me and welcome to my presentation on the difference between ESG and sustainability. So let me just start with explaining about ESG first. So I'll give you a background about ESG investing, um, the growth over the past two decades and the criticisms behind it over the recent few years. Um, its shortfalls bring about the conflation with the term sustainability. So what is ESG? ESG, as you all know, stands for Environmental, Social and Governance Factors. These factors are used to measure a company's long-term performance alongside financial factors. The term ESG is most commonly referred to in the finance industry. Investors or fund managers use ESG criteria in their investment decision-making process, and this is called ESG investing. So talking about the growth of ESG investing, which has been quite pronounced over the last, I would say, decade or two, this chart shows the growth in PRI, PRI signatories. PRI stands for Principles of Responsible Investing, and they're a group of the world's largest institutional investors supported by the United Nations. So this graph shows that initially in 2006, they started with 63 signatories, and then in just 15 years, it has grown to almost 4,000. So as at end of 2021, the investment value or the value of funds they manage has grown from $6.5 million to $121 trillion, which is a significant growth. We can deduce that the interest in ESG investing is growing among the general public as well as institutional investors. So what are the types of ESG investing? When we talk about types of investing, I'll just give you a practical application of it. It's when a portfolio manager um, that looks after a fund or multiple funds decides what type of investment strategy they're going to follow. So specific to ESG investing, these are the strategies managers can follow. So starting off, there is positive screen screening. This involves selecting only the companies that overcome a defined ranking hurdle. So companies are given a score based on a variety of ESG factors and the companies that overcome that score or achieve that score are the ones that are put into that ESG fund. A shortfall using this method is that there is no defined way of giving a score. So for example, one fund manager will do it based on providing a high score for climate change. Another fund manager might give a higher score for social factors like gender equality. Um, so on and so forth. It's very subjective and does not follow a universal definition. This is one of the criticisms which I will speak about in more detail soon. So moving on to the next investing type, um, negative screening. This is um, avoiding investing in companies whose products or services is considered unethical or harmful to society or animals. For example, companies involved in the production of alcohol, tobacco, weapons, etc. Uh, these companies are screened out uh, of the fund. Next, impact investing. Impact investing refers to investments made with specific intent on generating positive, measurable social or environmental impact alongside a financial return. So measurement and tracking of the agreed upon impact is a focus. Thematic investing. Investing in assets with specific themes such as clean energy, green technology, sustainable agriculture, gender diversity, or affordable housing. The next one, active shareholder engagement. This is definitely the most time consuming type of investing. Um, it's where the investor seeks to have significant influence over the decisions made by the company regarding ESG matters. So the, uh, in the, Fund manager will get involved in uh, management decision making and they'll have constant dialogue with the management and they'll have voting rights where they can uh, vote at the annual general meetings. And the next one, ESG integration is also time consuming. And this again involves going in into a lot of detail um, in the investment decision making process. However, how it's different to active shareholder management is that they do not get voting rights and they do not um, engage with the management on making decisions. Um, they might interview the management to get further details on 
the company, but um, that's as far as it goes. Coming to the criticisms that the ESG industry has been facing, looking at the first point, this is about ESG analysis being inward looking rather than outward looking. So it is looking at the effects of climate change and other negative effects on the organization. So whereas what they really should be looking at is the impact that the organizations are having on the environment and society. I will go into more detail on this shortly. Um, sec the second point is that there are no defined standards set by regulator regulators. This leads to greenwashing. So going into more detail, one of the largest rating companies called Sustainalytics publishes physical climate risk metrics. And these are aimed at helping investors understand their exposure to climate change. Again, it's inward looking. So they look at how their own investments are impacted by the environment and the potential financial impact of their portfolio companies. So this is just an excerpt I took from Bloomberg about MSCI ratings, which is another big ratings company. Um, it says yet, there's virtually no connection between MSCI's better world marketing and its methodology. That's because the ratings don't measure a company's impact on the earth and society. In fact, they gauge the opposite, the potential impact on the world of the world on the company and its shareholders. MSI, MSCI doesn't dispute this characterization. It defends its methodology as the most financially relevant for the companies it rates. So you can see where we're going with this. It's very finance, finance centric. And their main goal is ensuring the long-term performance of the company and reducing its risk from environmental and um, social factors. So not only rating companies, there are many other investors also who consider positively um, the companies if they have sufficient risk mitigation strategy. So just mitigating their risks and reducing exposure to the environment and pr protecting themselves from climate change and other catastrophes. So this is definitely not sustainable. So coming to the issue of no standard definitions of ESG. So if you look at the two figures on, um, or the exhibits on the right-hand side, exhibit two and exhibit three, the first exhibit is how one company, which is PRI, um, principles of responsible investing, as mentioned before, how they categorize environmental, social, and governance factors. And the second exhibit is another company called FTSE Russell, which is also one of the largest index providers in the finance world. This is how they categorize their ESG reporting. So if I just take one example, pollution, which I've highlighted here in red, circled here in red, if a company has good pollution controls, PRI will give the company a higher score um, for environmental factors as pollution is under the pillar of the environmental pillar. Whereas FTSE Russell would give a high score um, or a larger weight to environmental and social factors as they have pollution under both topics. So you can see how this is not standardized and there'll be different scores given um, essentially for the same uh, issue or factor. So there's no common way that every company is going to define what ESG is. And this makes, compar this makes it very difficult to compare between companies. So coming to ESG ratings in particular, why am I focusing so much on ESG ratings? It's because when analyzing ESG impact on a company, one of the main things that investors look at are the ratings. This is one of the main determining factors for their de decision making. So here we come to the next, to another problem. So ESG ratings are meant to provide information on the environmental, social and governance performance of the company. However, significant shortcomings exist in their objectives and methodologies. So, of course, one reason for this is they do face challenges, which are understandable. Like, for example, there's too much information points falling under the scope of ESG, which we can all understand. Cost of gathering information is difficult. Um, difficulty in measuring ESG factors, lack of quantifiable information, and de determining the impact of ESG factors. 
all true and fair. However, despite these challenges, all ratings agencies should follow a comparable or similar approach and methodology. So again, this comes back to the lack of regulation and standards in the market. For example, if measuring gender diversity in a company, there should be a standard measure which states that board composition should be made of 40% females or a quantifiable measure like that. They can provide a single weight or a set a standard. Another example is when placing weights on individual components and calculating overall score. The raters should use a standardized weight for the major components. So if di different companies are using different weights, for example, one gives a larger weight to environmental factors, another company gives a larger weight to governance factors, it's not comparable. And it's not going to be understood by ESG investors who are in large proportion, the general public. And then you have ESG ratings, which are reported on seven point uh, letter basis by some and a 12 point um basis by other agencies like a minus to a, a positive to d minus and this makes it very hard to compare coming to real world examples of greenwashing so you may have all seen this in the news tesla was removed from the s p 500 esg index due to the car makers lack of low carbon strategy allegations of racial discrimination poor working conditions etc However, if you dig deeper into the same index, S&P 500, there are companies like ExxonMobil and other oil companies in its top rankings, which is very contradictory. Um, according to Bloomberg, 4,800 ESG funds representing $2.3 trillion in total assets were found to hold at least $8.3 billion worth of um, funds in Russian assets just before Russia launched a major attack against Ukraine. Third example, Vanguard, one of the world's largest investment companies, was pulled up in 2019 for having a number of companies linked to alcohol, tobacco, and gambling within its ESG portfolio. So looking um, at so Schroeder's Institutional Investor Study has done a survey on which factors do investors consider the most challenging when it comes to investing in responsible or sustainable investment? And greenwashing is their biggest concern, as you can see from this. Looking at another survey done by PRI, they surveyed 1,100 financial professionals across the globe, and they found that these were the main concerns of the investors. The first one being the main driver of ESG integration is risk management and client demand. Like I mentioned, the companies are mainly interested in just mitigating risks and reducing their exposure to climate risk. Second one, the main barriers to ESG integration are limited, is a limited understanding of ESG issues and a lack of comparable ESG data. Investors acknowledge that ESG data have come a long way, but advances in quality and comparability of data still have a long way to go. Next, it would be helpful for issuers in invest issuers and investors to agree upon a single ESG reporting standard, which could streamline the data collection process and produce more quality data. Many workshop participants are concerned that ESG funds offered to many investors may be driven by marketing decisions and not to be not to be true ESG investments. So that's exactly what greenwashing is, right? So that's the end of my bit on ESG and now coming to sustainability and explaining why it's different. A strong sustainability strategy emphasizes the need for science-based targets. Sorry. Um, so a strong sustainability strategy emphasizes the need for science-based targets, context-based context metrics, and ethics-based norms. So what are science-based goals? And I'm sure all of you know, there are climate science-based emissions or goals or targets that are established. For example, the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree limit for global warming, quantifiable uh, limit. And then we have context-based goals, which is, as the, name, as the name suggests, provides context. It gives an, organ an organization-level breakdown of allocations and burdens that each organization should bear and thresholds that each organization should set in order to be aligned with the science-based target. 
And then in addition to that, you have ethics-based goals, which is, as the name suggests again, fair trade-based goals, which supports this. Moving on to how the competing principles of ESG and sustainability came about. Ideally, ESG is not all bad, but how did it become more in reference with financial analysis rather than having a science-based goal connected to it? So in 2002, GRI, which is Global Reporting Initiative, I'm sure most of you have heard about this as well. They are one of the largest and most influential standard setting bodies when it comes to sustainability reporting. Um, together with ISSB, which is Inter um, International Sustainability Standards Board. So GRI introduced the sustainability context principle in 2002. It reads, um, I'll just read a portion of it. The performance of the organization in the context of the limits and demands placed on environmental and social resources at the sectoral, local, regional, or global level. So it has reference to science-based goals and setting limitations and allocations based on local, regional, and global, which provides context. So this is focused on normative sustainability performance. Then closely followed by that, UN published a report called Who Cares Wins? And this was the first report that introduced um, the or made reference to the term ESG, which was published in 2004. So again, I've taken an excerpt of this. We are convinced that in the interest of investors, asset managers, and securities brokerage houses alike to improve the integration of ESG factors in financial analysis. This will contribute to better investment markets as well as to sustainable, as well as to the sustainable development of the planet. So see how they're making reference to financial analysis and saying ESG has to be linked to financial performance. They're also saying that that's how we can achieve sustainable development of the planet. So this is more focused on incremental, incrementalist environmental, social and governance themes. And this is kind of where these two competing principles started and where the two ideologies um, started going on two different paths. Would say. So how did it progress? The purpose of sustainability reporting was to identify how companies' activities affected the environment and society, while ESG, on the other hand, grew to be more in relation to how environmental, social, and governance factors affected financial performance. So this actually created a conundrum for GRI as they had to choose a side. So they reported standards um, for sustainability reporting. It's either they stayed true to its original definition of sustainability context principle, which is science-based and referring to capital like resources with limits and allocations, or they had to compromise their integrity and embrace the finance-centric ESG ideology. So ESG appealed more to the investment community, the very industry that GRI needed the backing of. So GRI, like I said, is one of the largest sustainability reporting standard standards so they needed they needed everyone's support right they needed the support of the financial community and the financial community has size and power going for them so this influenced GRI to side more with the ESG community so until today regulatory bodies lean more towards financial performance so GRI failed to provide sufficient guidance to enable organizations to implement Sustainable the sustainability context principle, GRI sustainability principle in the next version dropped the reference to environmental and social resources. In addition to that, another very large standard setting body, as mentioned before, ISSB, focused on enterprise value creation and value creation for providers of financial capital and other key stakeholders. ISSB makes no reference to ecological or social thresholds, which is what context-based metrics is supposed to do. So this comes to the need for regulation. The Carbon Disclosure Project emphasizes need for consistent, standardized, and comparable disclosure by companies to make progress in building a sustainable future. 
So they say when it comes to building a more sustainable economy, being on the same page as everyone else is crucial. As companies, cities, states, and regions journey towards net zero, we must ensure consistency in benchmarks, science-based targets, and definitions of terms. So one solution is that ESG analysis incorporates should incorporate the externalities the companies create, right? So externalities should be priced into all the products and services sold. All negative externalities are a market failure, and that's best dealt with through regulatory or government intervention. To correct this failure, regulators can set standards, promote transparency, and ensure comparability, while government intervention can include subsidies, taxes, quotas, and various other policies. And when regulators and governments fail, the shareholders should have the ethical drive to monitor the issues in a company that create negative externalities. So how can organizations be more sustainable? Companies should adhere to science-based targets, initiative disclosures. So SBTI, what is SBTI? It is a partnership between CDP, UNGC, World Resource Institute, and the World um, Worldwide Fund for Nature. SBTI drives ambitious climate actions in the private sector by enabling organizations to set science-based greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. SBTI's net zero standard is the world's leading framework for setting corporate emissions targets in line with climate science. So MSCI in a study found that on average, companies who had committed to SBTI standards were more likely to have disclosed value chain emissions with target level data. So this is upstream and downstream, which is with regard to scope one, two, and three as well. A second option is the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS. So GFANS provides credible forward-looking metrics to contribute to the progress of net zero commitments and reallocation of capital to support the transition to a net zero economy. So who is GFANS? It's the world's largest coalition of financial institutes committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And it is recommended that companies follow their proposed metrics to support this transition to uh, net zero. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. And um, so the issue in summary is the fact that there are no set regulations um, to either follow, you know, SBTI or GFANS or any other standards. Um, it's all voluntary so far. So there are no, there is no um, definition set for ESG which is why it leads to greenwashing um, as each company organization fund manager can um, define or you know provide uh, subjective weights as um, to whatever um, the subjective decision making that they um, do right so we really should advocate for more regulations and standard standardized definitions for ec investing and when we ourselves look into investing in responsible or sustainable assets. We should really look into if they're following, um, you know, these certain metrics like SBTI um, uh, and GFANS, which is still, like I said, voluntary. So thank you everyone um, for listening um, and joining me. <clears throat> I hope this was helpful and um, keep on thriving.